Hello, my name is Trey Ventor, and this is sort of a literature review or an overview of some of the texts I used in a recent lecture um, I did on the 8th of March on race, whiteness, and racism in the English literature, in the English literature canon. In putting the original lecture together, I understood uh, for those watching that talk, the sheer volume of text was massive, but also the diversity of text. So I've put together a shorter video just to highlight some of some of them to you. In talking to English teachers in both my community and those outside of it, it's telling them to observe that the sort the sorts of texts I used, I found that all I find most useful in critiquing English literature are not actually literary criticism at all. Um, Many of them are history books and sociology books, documentaries to ethnography, or to ethnography. Also work from journalists like British by Afua Hirsch um, and Superior, uh, The Return of Race Science by Angela Sini. Um, but I'm going to start by talking about the texts I found most useful in discussing whiteness. And this means looking at whiteness beyond, um, or looking at whiteness that goes beyond the exclusiveness of white privilege. But I want to begin with white supremacy. The murder of George Floyd, the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others last year were a catalyst, act as a catalyst for a good many, for a good many people to start talking about race, racism, white supremacy and others and other things. But really, what this did not do, I believe, in a critical way, or in a way that I didn't think was critical enough, was invite conversations about whiteness, but more specifically, white supremacy. Since it is entirely possible to discuss racism as a divorced concept from the overarching system of white supremacy. So in the context of the literary canon, you may want to start by looking at what the organization White Spaces talk about, and also what film studies professor which Dio wrote about, wrote about in his 1997 book, his essay collection, White. In lots of these canon texts, including their adaptations, we often think of, think of these characters as raceless, since white film, TV, literature icons, heroes and heroines are predominantly framed as the norm. In the canon, the continuation of seeing white people as unraced may look like the Bennetts, so the Bennett family in Pride and Prejudice, Dorothea Brooke in Middlemarch, or even the Pevensies in the Narnia novels by children's author C.S. Lewis. This tells us that white, white people are the default setting in comparison to black people, brown people, indigenous people, Asian people, and people of color, who are often framed in proximity to their race. Culture, media, and most certainly educational curriculum subtly and unsubtly tell us that whiteness is the absence of race, the invisible race. Other people have races, whilst white people do not. What we can do here is look at how being white in this time, so the times these books were published in, was to the benefit of these characters in the wider context of global colonial whiteness, since even as late as the 1950s with the Narnia books, these were the days of the British Empire, as countries fought and bled for their independence up until the 1970s and even up until the 1980s as well, I believe. I would then begin to look at Ruth Frankenberg's 1993 book, White Women, Race Matters, The Social Construction of Whiteness, where you may find some context to white womanhood and the role of white women in white supremacy. Additionally, um, the book They Will Have Property, White Women as Slave Owners in the American South by historian Stephanie E. Jones Rogers. For those of you teaching in the British context, uh, I would be very careful as this text was written in the context of, of American enslavement. However, if you are reading books like John Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men, or even Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe, the, um, Ruth Frankenberg's book might add some insight for you as teachers. I would also look at Charles Mills's 2004 essay, Racial Exploitation and the Wages of Whiteness, 
which you will find in the essay collection What White Looks Like, African American Philosophers on the Whiteness Question, which was edited by George Yancey. Since most of the characters are white in many of these books, we also need to be thinking about white cultures and identities and how some white people are not white enough. In Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Fagin is often referred to as, and I quote, the Jew. And this may get us to think about discourses of anti-Semitism in the 19th century. Here, I would direct you to texts that show how whiteness can differentiate itself among, amongst groups read as white. In relation to social class distinctions, Stephanie Lawler writes about the construction of the middle class in her 2005 journal article, Disgusted Subjects, The Making of Middle Class Identities. And I would also look at the 1997, sorry, 1998, 1998 journal article by Alastair Bonnet, how the British working class became white, the symbolic reformation of the racialized, of racialized capitalism. Furthermore, um, Double Down News and their videos on antisemitism in the UK context, uh, I find them quite useful as well. In this train of thought, if you are if you are wanting to show visual representations of such in your classes to students, you may want to sh start with clips or footage from recent TV programs like BBC's Poldark or Peaky Blinders, or even the Netflix series, The English Game, that charts the rise of football in the class wars between the working class and middle class in England um, in the early 20th century, I think, or late 19th, late 19th century, early 20th century. But back to anti-Semitism, more in the public consciousness, you may want to draw links between anti-Semitism um, in the 19th century in how Dickens writes Fagin um, and sort of link it possibly to the prelude to the rise of anti-Semitism in the early 20th century, um, which led into the, to the Holocaust where Jews were being sent to Nazi concentration, Nazi extermination camps, concentration camps, like Auschwitz, Treblinka, Sobibor, Westerbrook, Dachau and Buchenwald. Maybe to engage students and young people or simply Joe and Jane blogs in general in society, it's worth using references in, mode, in a mode familiar to them. Whilst books and journal articles are useful and should be used, I would also look at documentaries made on this as well. Most recently, I saw Judge Robert Winder and his episode of Who Do You Think You Are, and also his two-part documentary series, My Family, The Holocaust and Me, both on BBC iPlayer. Here we can critique the underlying biases in knowledge production and education of what is and what in education of what is and is not seen as a source, a legitimate source. Getting students to critically debate and argue what knowledge is and isn't, and who gets to decide what is what is or is not valued. In the realm of epistemology, so the theory of knowledge, we know in academia there is an entrenched bias against qualitative research methods in comparison to quantitative. Why can't a documentary be seen as a legitimate source? Stories of Holocaust survivors are valid and the lived history and these lived histories discussing the impact the Holocaust has had on the generations that came afterwards may, but may, may be even more effective at engaging students and people more generally than the words of often detached academics. In relation to that, it would also be worth looking at the damaging effect of Holocaust denial as a further, as a further context. We know the Holocaust happened. It is well evidenced. evidenced. But in 1998, Holocaust denier David Irving took American historian Deborah Lipstadt to court when she supposedly, li supposedly libeled him in her 1993 book, Denying the Holocaust. With the film Denial dramatizing um, the case and the events surrounding it, starring Rachel Waits as Lipstadt and Timothy Spool as Irving. This was a media trial where really the future of history was decided in a, in a courtroom, in a court of law. In teaching the Holocaust, do students know about this case? And in the context of whiteness, what, what this narrative of the, of the Jewish people shows between the 19th and 20th centuries 
is how some are seen as not white as others and how whiteness can differentiate itself. Further to these, I would look at more recent um, discourses around anti-Semitism and I reiterate to look at Double Down News as those videos might be a springboard into something, other things as well, um, into more uh, other sources. On that note, I think it's now relevant that we look at the more widely known and more probably more famous white privilege. In the context of the literary canon, this is when we this is when these white characters being seen as unraced can be seen as a white privilege. More recently, Rennie Edo Lodge wrote about white privilege in her 2017 book, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. However, discourses on white privilege. Um, in print to go further back. In the early 20th century, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote, was writing about this in his 1920 essay, Souls of White Float, which articulates the imperial roots of American racism. You can now find that online. Or if you want it in print, you will, you will find it in the book Dark Water, Voices from Within, from Within the Veil, which was republished, which has been republished by Verso Books, I think, in 2016. In the 1960s, Theodore Allen and Noel Ignatin began to articulate thoughts on what they called white skin privileges. In 1989, Peggy McIntosh arrived with her famous article, White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. When thinking about this historically, concepts of white privilege have changed over time and they can also change depending on geographies. What would happen if we applied these concepts to English-Irish relations after the East Horizons of 1916 and the subsequent Irish Civil War? Are the Irish white or not white enough? Did they become white? Here I would direct you to Noel Ignatin's 1995 book, How the Irish Became White, and also Anoop Nayak's 2007 journal article, critical whiteness studies, where he writes, some people are, white, are whiter than others, some are not white enough, and many are inescapably cast beneath the shadow of whiteness, end quote. In response to this question of white and not white enough, I find the show Downton Abbey quite compelling to watch in this context, very much so in the arc of Tom Branson and how he becomes part of the Crawley family introduced to the audience as the family driver and an Irish socialist, he sort of has to become English and thus white to be accepted by the family. Other writers on white privilege, um, in addition to the aforementioned, also include American author Tim Wise and a UK academic, UK academic Professor Kawant Bhopal, with her 2019 book, White Privilege, the myth of a post-racial society. There are many writers and academics that have penned work on whiteness, but these are just a few. In many of these canonical books, we, can, we see grandiose representations of wealth. And in that idea, we may see that much of the wealth of these characters may have been built off the labor of enslaved Africans in the Americas or enslaved black people. Um, and also the exploitation of other colonized people across the British Empire. What this also tells us is that the houses in these, in these stories go far beyond the, the construct of the novel itself. That in the work of Jane Austen, for example, this leaves the door wide open to see how this is also part of societal critique and conversation of, no, of national trust monuments, buildings and grounds, and how we talk about these places in the context of colonialism and perhaps allow us to better learn and educate ourselves of what enslavement and colonialism really did to Britain economically. Literature wise, it might be worth looking at Historic England, Historic England's recent research audit um, entitled Trans Transatlantic Slave Economy and England's built and England's built environment. It was done by Dr. Mary Willis and Dr. Madge Dresser. Further to that, Edward Said um, and his 1993 book, Culture and Imperialism, 
particularly the chapter where he talks about Jane Austen and, and Mansfield Park. Additionally, have an, an, have an explore of the University College, University College London's legacies for British slave ownership. So in histories of enslavement, we must also we must not just we must not only look at where the money went, but also the arguments made in academic um, circles that justified the subjugation of people racialized as black. And in that idea, I would direct you to, to I'll direct you to Superior, the return of race science by science journalist and author Angela Sini, published in 2019 and also Black Skin, White Masks by Martinican psychiatrist Franz Fanon. Lots of the texts mentioned thus far are relevant to contemporary discussions about, about um, forms of discrimination like, like misogynoir as well, detailing the historical underpinnings of the intersectional, racist, misogynistic violence against women and girls racialized as black. That not only, that not only happens in many of these texts um, in the canon, either physically or in reference, but also in adaptations like Sanditon, based on the Jane Austen, based on Jane Austen's unfinished novel. But these, but these also happen daily in the here and now at every level of British society, including to, to including to black, including to young black girls. A novel is not just a novel. These texts, in my opinion, are historical fingerprints. Professor Olivet Ottel gives further context of violence against black women in her book, African Europeans and Untold History, um, going back to the 12th and the 13th century. And in relation to people um, that are mixed race or multiracial, the racisms held in many of these texts can be contextualized by writers including David Olasoga, Professor David Olasoga, with his, 20, with his 2016 book, um, Black and British, as well as uh, Professor Paul Gilroy's 1993 book, Black Atlantic, Modernity and Double Consciousness. Here you may want to look at some of the more institutional documents as well. Um, for example, how in 1930, Muriel Fletcher produced a document that that stigmatized mixed race children of African heritage in Liverpool. So uh, black, uh, black, one black parent and one white parent um, popularizing the derogatory term and, and, and I quote, um, half caste in uh, UK lexicon. A critique can be found, a critique of this document can be found um, and it was done by Mark Christian in his 2008 journal article titled The Fletcher Report, 1930, a historical case study of contested black mixed heritage Britishness. So it's in thing, documents like this, particularly looking at the work of, of race scientists, and I say race scientists in air quotes, as well as eugenicists, this sort of direct connections to books like Dracula and Dracula's or Bram Stoker's representations of, of hybridity that in my reading stigmatized concepts of racial mixing. In addition, Edward Long's um, History of Jamaica, the 1774 text, which, which got reprinted um, in, in 2002 is also available. When reading these books, we must also recall that what they are not saying. Here, I would usher you towards author Chimamanda Ngozi Adishi's 2009 TED talk entitled The Danger of the Single Story. These writers painted an image of Africa and Africans and other colonized peoples to give support to the physical dominations of colonial rule that these countries and their diasporas have still not recovered from worldwide. By neglecting to say what happened first, the positionality of the story and the storyteller changes. In the context of colonial literature and the canon, the decision to omit the role of racial hierarchies deprives readers of the epistemological context, so based on knowledge, theory of knowledge, that came to underpin the justifications for colonial ambition. Any critiques of the canon must take into an account that these texts are not isolated from the worlds they were published in. Also, any critiques must talk about whiteness, 
and ultimately seek to unpack how seeing white people as unraced in these books is an example of how introverted white supremacy is or can be. To be seen as just human. What we can also look at is this idea of writing back as Jean Rhys did in writing Why Did Cigar So See in response to Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre from the point of view of the white Creole character, Bertha or Antoinette, Bertha or Antoinette, as Jean Rhys was a white Creole herself. Here, you may want to also look at the 1993 film of the same name and the 2001 book by Carl Plaza, White Cigar So See, Reader's Guide to, Assen to Essential Criticism. Also, the number of African writers that tried to subvert the stereotypes made of the image of Africa and black people that had been presented by white European writers between the 18th century up, and, up until the 20th century. David Olasoga's documentary, Africa Turns the Page, is a good introduction to the books that helped change the image of Africa, an Afro-pessimistic Afro image created at least in part through European art, including literature. Afro-pessimism denoting the image that something is wrong with Africans. Here I would look at the 2011 journal article by De Beery and Lau, Afro-pessimism, a genealogy of discourse. So really there's lots of supporting resources that can be used to better understand these texts, especially for educators, school teachers and the like, that whilst most of these texts I have mentioned in this video, but one have not, have not been literary criticism, they are useful in showing how literature cannot be divorced from its historical and social context. It shows that in any approach to these texts to gain maximum impact, that, that, that approach has to be multidisciplinary. Firstly, I think there is room for collaboration between English and history programmes. Secondly, the social sciences as well. And in the university context, definitely critical race studies decolonial studies and whiteness studies. This is just a very brief overview of some of the literature I used in the original talk. If you want me to deliver the original lecture on race and the canon for your institution, you can email me via the link to my contact form in the description. You will also find a, a link to the further reading, including all the text mentioned. Um, and here is the reference list for this um, brief overview of the literature I used. So just pause the video here and it continues to the next page here as well. Um, and there's my social media as well if you want to contact me there as well. So this was just an overview of some of the literature I used in the original talk. And if you want me to, to do it for your institution, don't hesitate to get in contact. Thank you very much.